David, look, th thanks very much for finding the time to do this interview for the Reputation Council. Always, always pleased to discuss reputation with you, Miller. Thank you. Um, just sort of kicking off, I mean, how would you could describe the, the, the kind of the organisation of the uh, communications function within BP? The organisation has evolved in the last few years. Um, we've been in a process of, um, of reunifying a decentralised function. So uh, a few years ago that was bringing together all the communications professionals. Uh, then we added in corporate brand and, and advertising. Uh, then we added in some more embedded communicators who were out there in the business and uh, latterly we've now added in external affairs, so community affairs, government relations and social investment as well. But if I was to kind of you know, uh, ask you to uh, say prioritise your, your two or three key issues that you focus on strategically as it were, what, would, what kind of things would they be? Clearly, the, the, the key issue for us has been a, a sort of the, the recovery, the recovery from 2010 and, and the Deepwater Horizon accident, uh, reputationally uh, as well as the recovery operationally for, for the company. Uh, latterly, the, the sort of second and most pressing issue has been resilience to this sort of very significant and steep drop in the oil price. Um, and but the third really now is, is probably around the carbon agenda or the low carbon agenda I should say and, and climate change. So how, how does your narrative differentiate you, uh, make BP distinctive? We've spent a lot of time looking at this and, and part of that differentiation actually is in the history of the organisation and what it's been through. A lot of the big companies, they all work together, they're in partnership and in, in different projects, etc. Yeah, they all face a lot of the same big issues, the geopolitical issues or, or the issues around things like climate change or issues around safety. So you know, to a degree a lot of the narrative is going to be core but actually you've got to find some elements that really define the, the character of the organisation. The Beyond Petroleum proposition that, uh, that, that, that be, is that still is that still living is that still alive is that still part of your narrative we don't use it anymore as a, as a sort of tagline or a proposition um, and I think really you know we've sort of moved beyond that if you excuse the the, the, the pun really but you know I think in in the aftermath of, of Deepwater Horizon and and the, the need for the company to sort of recover its its position you know in the industry uh, the narrative really took a sort of quite a sea change at that point. A few sentences, what makes BP different? Um, I would say that, you know, this, this is a company that has a long history and it has a long history of learning, adapting and changing. Um, it has a, a, a remarkable track record when you look at the story of BP, of a company that has navigated change and uncertainty for the benefit of different audiences and that's sort of very core to you know, how we still see the company, you know, 108 years later. What are the kind of challenges that you face in your role uh, from a reputational management perspective uh, and in the context of BP? Complexity is, is still one of the biggest challenges of you know complexity of, of organizations generally and, and how things get done so that's a huge challenge of, of how do you actually navigate your way through that complexity uh, I think the challenge of, of continued transparency in terms of how do you how do you equate those two things the issues of complexity of getting things done and the issues of transparency um, the third I, I would sort of characterise as this issue of information asymmetry, that, you know, information moves so fast in the outside world, you know, how do you keep pace with that inside an organisation? You know, I see reputation as being, you know, fundamentally about two things. It's about risk management and it's about mitigating risks, yes. But on the other side of that ledger, it's about opportunity. And the opportunities to me are about access. Uh, in our industry, that's access to new resources, it's access to new markets, it's access to people, and it's access to capital. Uh, 
And you know, given the nature of the sector, do you think that sets any unique challenges from the point of view of reputation management communications, the fact that you have got this kind of magnifying glass, as it were? I'm not sure that's unique to, to oil and gas or extractive industries. I think that's everywhere. That's the, the, the nature of the world we live in now, isn't it? That you know, regulatory pressures are there, uh, and you need to take those on board when you're thinking reputationally, uh, which means that you need to work very closely with your, with your legal team. You need to work increasingly closely with your ethics and compliance team uh, with all the issues you have around you know, anti-bribery and corruption and counterparty due diligence and a, a plethora of, uh, of different processes that you need to make sure are observed to make sure that you know, safe and reliable operations you know, is really followed and adhered to from a reputational point of view as well as you know, just from an operational point of view. But actually from a working point of view uh, you need to work very closely. I mean the, the, the floor my team work on here you know, we sit, we co-locate with, with some of our legal team right, so right. that they are there, they're accessible uh, and that sort of drives the right working behaviours. Mm -hmm. The phrase that you know, your employees are an asset and uh, they are your ambassadors, I think, is, is, is very well known. What, what, what makes those kind of phrases really stand up? <laughs> It's, it, it's a challenge. Yeah, we have 80,000 employees. They operate, you know, anything from scientists and geologists through to people who, who work on, you know, retail sta service station forecourts. So you've got a, a vast range of different employees with a lot of different backgrounds in a lot of different countries. So, you know, I think the, the, the challenge is really how do you make sure that people understand the context of, of what, what influences how they do their job? How do they understand the priorities? It's sort of a very simple framework that's uh, called the ACE model, which is around align, connect and enable, uh, which is really how do line managers uh, engage with their people? You know, how do we make sure they are, the people are aligned with the agenda, whether that's the group agenda or the specific business agenda? Uh, how do we make sure they're connected to, to what's going on? So, you know, in terms of their own networks, uh, and how, how do we actually enable line managers to, to do that? What are the kind of emotional touch points um, for working for BP. A lot of the DNA of BP is, is scientific and engineering in terms of background, which means the rational side of things is very important to, to people. They need to understand the context, they need to understand the logic of what they're doing. But of course, you know, 80,000 people is 80,000 people. So, you know, how do you connect, you know, on a, on a more emotional level? A lot of that is actually about connecting back to, to the values and behaviours of the organisation. And, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, it post sort of 2010 on, on working with the values and behaviours and you know sort of hardwiring that into our reward and performance mechanisms for the whole organisation so that we were rewarding the behaviours as well as the performance of, of people across the organisation. So how do you use insight within Within BP, how do you use research within BP to uh, gain a sense of whether you're you know, making progress or not? Well, organisations are awash with data now. Um, we, we don't lack for data. Uh, the problem is actually making sense of the data in, you know, in a timely fashion. So, um, yes, we, we have, uh, as you know, we, we, we do polling, we have reputation measurement. There's a sort of art and a science to this. The science is actually that the data you can generate but the art is actually to, to define something out of it and actually say this is, what, this is the insight that's actually coming out of this, this is the nugget that we need, really need to think about and this is where we need to act. We track uh, all of our internal surveys and we, we look at sentiment and particularly around sentiment around trust and, and confidence uh, which we can monitor you know, on a pretty much a weekly basis. You know, from BP's point of view, the, the, the easy answer is from 2010 you know, when, we, when we developed a, sort of a five-year reputation recovery plan as, as, as part of the, sort of the, the recovery of the company. You know, clearly, you know, all of our trust metrics showed that trust had you know, significantly dropped after, after the incident. Um, so, you know, logically, we wanted something that we could go after of saying, well, rebuilding trust is, is crucial. If you like, a, a, a simple, clear set of measures that we could track, we could report back to the executive team, we could report back to the board, and actually we've been doing that for the last five years. What, what companies do you admire? I mean, what, what, you know, and I know there's kind of probably the usual suspects, etc. But kind of companies that you just think have have uh, have managed to really 
you know, do it well in terms of reputation management? It's a good question. One would, one would always be tempted to say startups because yeah. they have a clean sheet of paper. Um, I mean, you know, clearly the, the, there are companies, and I, I, you know, I always look, look to the US uh, around companies like IBM and, and GE who seem to have, you know, have very integrated models of, of reputation management where they seem to have integrated their, their marketing communications, their corporate communications and their CSR into something that feels coherent, certainly fr from the outside. Um, technology companies, obviously, because they seem to have sexy products, which seems to help. Um, but you know, I'm 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 also interested in in looking at, at you know people like sort of you know governments or, or NGOs or you know new new organisations who, you know maybe are starting to do this in a slightly different way. What are the kind of qual do you think the qualities required of someone like you have evolved over time and and, uh, and if and, and if they have what are what are the key elements that you need now <laughs> apart from the crystal ball yes <laughs> and the suit of armor um, I, I, it's a great question again you know I think the, the, there's a, there's a few qualities I mean clearly from from an authority point of view um, you know this this sort of nature of the of the, the, the chief operating officer or the chief reputation officer uh, that person has to have the authority and the access to the executive team you know to be part of decisions and to be informed with what's going on uh, I think then secondly the, there is a sort of a, the, there is a connectivity issue around um, you know, to be successful, you have to be very well networked into the other heads of function. Uh, I think you've got to have a, you know, a, a good and strong background in measurement and analytics of really understanding what's going on. Uh, I still think you actually have to be able to write well. I still think that's a, a skill we've almost forgotten about as people sort of get further and further up the ladder of actually if you're going to construct a narrative, you really need to know what a good narrative looks like. And I just don't think you can do that unless you have, you know, some journalistic background yes. or some journalistic skills. David, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time.